Hello everyone, welcome to Sega Saturn Shiro, the only podcast that cannot be reproduced. I'm Pat, and tonight's heroes are Claire, Dave, Kay, and of course, the most important, myself. <laughs> Woo! So as usual, let's start with the personal updates. Dave, what have you been up to since last cast? Let's see. Usually I say nothing, but this time around, actually, a lot has happened. And I guess I should start with uh, the most appropriate thing is that I received a reproduction in the mail. And it was from Simon over at the junkyard. And this was for a contest kind of thing that I that I kind of participated in on the junkyard. It was like a graphic design contest uh, for their 11th anniversary. And they sent me this wonderful Police Knots repro that Ben Boyd reproduced and then Marvin Macias did the discs for it and it's just beautiful and I did like a little video unboxing of it with my son and um so that was fun so that's the first thing and um I'm gonna say he was the highlight of that episode of that that unboxing he often is the highlight of any of the videos that I put up uh aside from that I had a, a few other pickups uh for my collection um haven't really picked up a whole lot of stuff until recently one of the guys on the Collections of America was getting rid of some of his high-profile games, and I got a copy of Earthworm Jim 2 from him and Warcraft 2, um, two really awesome games, and got them for a deal, so that was awesome. And then uh, Fighters Mega Mix picked that up. That's a great one that I is finally that the one added to my the, collection. Is that the one with the two Sonic for the Fighters characters in it? I think they might make an appearance in there. I don't know. I'm going to sound... That's a game that I really don't have... A whole lot of experience with even though a lot of people swear by it it's it's one that i've only recently added and i've never really spent a whole lot of time with it but everybody says it's like smash for the saturn yeah so, i mean uh, i heard that you can actually fight with the daytona usa car that i do know yeah it, it, it there is a hornet model in there and it's like the tires are like the hands and feet and I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to give it a shot, but um but the thing that I've been completely engrossed in uh lately is uh, a friend of K um he sold me a copy of Power Slave and um that game is just so great. Like it's so much better than I thought and it um I knew it was like a lobotomy soft game and I just think it's like Metroid Prime in Egypt, you know, and I used to compare it to like a Doom clone, but now it's kind of like been redefined for me. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we had a lot of fun uh, discussing that on the uh, on the Saturn Junkyard page, right? Yeah, a lot of people commenting. I know Simon loves the game. A lot of other people swear by the game. The dudes on DF Retro did a video of it, and that in Tatsu Mainframe, they did like retrospectives on Lobotomy Soft and talked to how great uh, this game, Power Slave or Exhumed, if you're in the UK. But yeah, it's that proprietary slave driver engine that that runs those first person shooters on the Saturn. Um, that really showed people that, you know, the Saturn can do FPSs um, and it can do them quite well. But the, but the great thing is that Power Slave isn't just a regular FPS. You know, it actually has a lot of depth to it. So it's a lot of fun. Highly recommend it. Nice. I will definitely be giving that a shot. I know you've been, uh, I know you've been really ranting on that. So I'm yeah, ranting sorry if happily I'm about that. Ranted. Yeah, happily. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I definitely want to give that a shot. So that's going to be uh, the next game I try out. Cool. So what I've been up to is I recently got a Rhea ODE, the optical drive emulator for the Sega Saturn. So I've been I've been playing a lot of that and I've been having a really good time playing it as well. Like I put like must I must have put fifty games on that thing that K was able to K I was able to get with a combination of stuff K lent me and stuff that are from my own collection. And I've been having a blast. I mean, it's it's great not worrying about it and having that total silence from the drive. So it was a it was very good, and I I love it so far. And I can't wait to see what I can play on it. It's going to be ridiculous, and it will make my job twenty times easier. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> You'll get it, man. You'll get it. Um, I made a, a funny post on the junkyard about Gun Griffin and how I threw it in the trash. That was fun. If you guys are part of the junkyard, you should check that out. It's a really good post, and uh, it'll open your eyes. <laughs> so one of the other things, I uh, I also learned how to back up my discs for the Rhea, so that was kind of cool and a neat experience. I always love learning new skills and new traits, so that was really good. 
I have the recommended drive for the Raya, by the way, it would have to be the 128 red and gray SanDisk Ultra Plus drives. It was really easy to get that up and running. So if you're looking for one and you can't find one that's compatible, that one definitely is. And that's a micro SD card. Besides that, I've just been playing more Saturn games because of that. And I also participate in Croc Friday, which we will get into a little bit later. (laughs) Yeah, um, that's the first thing on my list of what I've been up to. Last night, I actually finished Croc Legend of the Goggles for the first time. I've owned the game since it was released, and I never made it the whole way through. So I was pretty excited to finish that up. Um, Since our last cast, some pretty interesting Saturn-related things have fallen into my hands. Um, a few that I'd like to talk about. The first thing that I got is a VCD card. I don't own any supported games yet, but the thing that I'm most excited to try out is Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. That's one of my favorite games of all time. It's kind of sad that we don't have an English translation for it on the Saturn, but the video quality with the MPEG card is actually superior to the PlayStation version, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that looks on my system. I just can't wait to try it out. Um, I also got one of Kay's reproductions of Panzer Dragoon Saga, which I'm super happy to have because it's my favorite game of all time. I'm really loving his work on that and having it to display on my shelf with my collection. That's really cool. I really enjoy Kay's work. I think uh, he puts a lot of effort and times into those those big collections. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has a chance, I definitely would recommend that. And I'm not biased at all because he's a co-host or anything, right? No. He, he sets the bar, for sure. Now that you're caught up on the news, let's take a look at our obscure game of the cast, which is, of course, Croc. So, uh, Claire, did you want to start us off as this was your selection for the week? Sure. Croc is a game that I absolutely love, and it has a bit of a mixed reputation online. So, Croc was released in November 1997 for the PlayStation, Saturn, and PC. It was Argonaut Games' first foray into 3D platforming. And it definitely shows. And for those of you that don't know, Argonaut were the guys behind the legendary Star Fox games on the Super Nintendo and pushing that hardware with their 3D FX chips. Yeah, Dylan Cuthbert. Yeah, that guy is a legend. And essentially, they, of course, they released Star Fox. They had uh, they had Star Fox Two that came out. Everyone knows years later. Uh, Did they have another one like Road Road something? Anyways, about Stunt Race FX, right? Stunt Race FX. I think that was them, right? Argonaut. And essentially, what was really cool about the games that Argonaut's all about pushing the limits. And actual fun fact: uh, Croc was actually supposed to be a Yoshi platformer for the N64. That's right. But because of some dealings with Nintendo when falling out, it never came to be. And uh, I was watching a Larry Bundy Jr. video, and he mentioned this a little bit more. And his Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, one of his video featurettes on him, he mentioned that they uh, went to E3, and they, uh, after trying to pitch Croc unsuccessfully, went there and saw that they took his idea and their ingenuity and put it into Super Mario 64 instead. Unfortunately, that really got to him, and Shigeru went up to him and told him, all right, well, you'll get royal- royalties for it and everything. But I think just the idea of having your creation taken like that is pretty not that great. So they kind of yeah, were dissuaded. Nice. And unfortunately, it turned out that Croc was really not that great compared to the platform and, and, and ability of uh, Mario 64. So, which kind of bummed me out because there's a lot of good stuff with this. But um, uh, all history and stuff aside, what were you guys' thoughts on it? Uh, just playing it and sort of going along with it. So, my experience with Croc has been a pretty great one, but that said, I've also, my most recent playthrough was done with a friend, and I think that the game is so much more fun whenever you have someone 
to kind of laugh with because there are so many frustrating things about Croc from the controls, it's notorious for its tank controls, to the camera that never seems to move the way you want it. And also just the surprises that the levels throw at you um, throughout the whole game, elements being tossed at you left and right, right up until the final level. And it's so much fun to just kind of like flail about trying to figure out what you're doing in the game. And when you're successful, it's even that much more satisfying when you finally overcome the technical issues with it. And my personal feelings on Croc are that the art design is really strong. The character is adorable. Um, the platforming is actually pretty good. I think that the level of design is very unique and the difficulty curve feels natural. The first half of the game is definitely um, a little bit more kind as far as platforming goes and the challenge definitely ramps up during the second half. It, it just feels really good and natural. It's just held back by those controls in that camera. And I definitely agree with you on the points. I really enjoyed the music. Like I thought the music was great. I thought the level design was really interesting. Uh, I had some some issues with the, the placement of some of those boxes and how I thought it really slowed down the gameplay. Like just like if you miss the box, you're sitting there trying to get it. So I thought yeah. the way to open those boxes were kind of annoying. Where you have to basically do a a jump a jump smash to get get them open. I mm-hmm. thought that slowed it down. Uh, of course, the tank controls were just awful. Uh, my f- my fingers were numb after like five levels trying to play that thing, like the five little section levels. Mm-hmm. My thumbs were really uh, really te- get testing its limits at that point. Of course, you yeah. were using the digital controls. Yeah, but Which uh, I know some people favor, but it is it is a lot easier on your thumbs if you use the analog. I did not have that option, unfortunately, Dave. I know. I'm just saying. You if you're willing people. to, if you're willing to send me an analog pad, I'd probably. T- I actually favor the D-pad in this game. Um, mm-hmm. The controls and the overall feel, as far as movement goes in the game, is a little bit slow. And unfortunately, the Saturn version of this game is not the best experience. Um, I've played this game through the whole way on the PlayStation, and it, it's much better as far as frame rate and even um, the way that the levels are scaled and the models are scaled proportionally to one another. The Saturn version, um, Croc is actually scaled larger in comparison to the rest of the level elements Mm -hmm. and the camera sits a lot closer to him. So I think that all the glaring technical issues are even more obvious in the Saturn version, unfortunately. Yeah, I definitely noticed that it was hard to get some of those platforms. Like, I think it was 1-4 where you were in this room, and there's a platform on the top. But I didn't realize that there's a, a a ladder you could climb to get over there. So I was trying to jump up and try to change the camera, but it just was not working. So my brother and I, we used to, when we were young and... We- didn't have a lot of money we would actually go to the library and we would um check out games from the library and believe it or not they had this game and uh, we checked it out for so long that we ended up keeping it <laughs> so that's kind of a that's kind of a shameful story but uh it was it was a lot of fun actually and we even at that time could see you know its flaws and and uh, we're aware of them, but I think that, like Claire said, the charm that comes through, the the graphic design, the the art style, and the music, and everything like that, kind of hooked us. And and you know, you have to be careful with the platforming sometimes. But when you're kids and you have nothing but time, you're you're willing to put it in. And I could I could forgive anybody nowadays for for dismissing the game based on its weaknesses and and people are so spoiled now with you know really good controls in much better platforming experiences but you have to remember that when it comes to 3d platforming there really weren't any rules written at this point um you know nintendo came and and they hit a home run in one stroke with mario 64 and kind of taught everybody how you know a 3d platformer should look and feel and and this was being developed at the same time you know so it was like nobody really knew and and with all the other terrible efforts out there i think you know you kind of have to give this one credit because it's actually one of the better working 
ones out there, you know? Yeah, definitely. So I think, Kay, you uh, you were doing some research on a bug that uh, that appears in the Saturn version. Could you go a little bit into that? Yeah. Um, so I, I got into uh, Croc Friday pretty late. Um, it was Saturday when I did it. And uh, we were looking at uh, an issue that um, has a lot of uh, incorrect information uh, about what was going on. Uh Apparently, when you uh, put the game into the Saturn, um, close up the door and turn it on, on certain Saturns, the uh, the graphics will be completely corrupted. Uh, it looks like um, polygons are missing, and all, all you could see are like the texture, uh, the, the bitmap textures of what would be on a polygon in certain um, views. So, like for example, most of the time when you're you know playing with Croc you're looking at him from behind and his head would be missing but if you rotate the camera just enough you'd be able to see that his eyes had been rendered or his note like his snout has been rendered um because of the bit mapping that was going on there and there's a lot of different rumors about you know what was going on including something about a recall of the discs so uh we went ahead and i have two copies of this game and uh looked at the headers and also looked up some research there was no revision that can be found. And so to start doing some basic playtesting, um, I have a oval button Saturn um, with a 21-pin uh, CD-ROM board, uh, and that unit uh, had the error. When I popped it into my round button Saturn, um, later revision uh, of motherboard, it did not have the error. So really kind of a, an interesting little uh, bug that may have contributed to its terrible reputation. It so looked like said- a bad acid trip playing this game. Yeah, it's not playable. Some of the enemy models are just completely invisible from certain angles. I don't really know how you'd be able to get through the game with that. I didn't notice, uh, I didn't notice uh, with those enemies that uh, if you uh, one of the things we have to hit a box from the top down... And you, you would get you would hit the box, but the enemy would just go be on right on top of you. It was just awful. But uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to Kay is, uh, so are those the both of the ones you tested on? Those were twenty one pins, or one of those twenty pin? They're both twenty one pin, um, and so that's kind of like an interesting you know uh, you know tidbit about this is that it doesn't matter what model you use right like the the commonality is uh oval buttons are considered model one and round buttons are two it's nomenclature i just absolutely can't stand and this is a prime reason um they the motherboards in the later model um oval button units the revisions of those are the same motherboard that was utilized for the early round uh, button systems and the bug existed in, you know, one version, but not in the other. Uh, yeah, so because I used uh, when I used my when I was using my my oval button, the one with the twenty pin, mm-hmm. I did the fast boot with the Raya, which caused it to go back to the me- the uh, loading menu, and then start the game up. Similar to if you open the disc, put it in, and started started it. And I was I did not encounter that bug whatsoever. So, do you think maybe it has to do with the twenty-one pin? Might be the case. Well, since both of the units were twenty-one pin, I don't think so. And they mentioned, um, you know, in all the resources that I was able to see, and I think Claire saw it as well, um, that this appeared to be a uh, error on the developers, where they were only ever tested their builds on a development system, and. Um, they, uh, how did you put that, Claire? It was, uh, not loading up the, the polygons that it hadn't initialized? Yeah, they, they didn't test on a retail unit. They used their development systems, and from what I gathered, um, the chips were not initialized in the same way in the retail units, which is why we had these missing polygons. But that can be circumvented. All of these issues can be circumvented if the game is started from the CD player. Apparently that initializes whatever needed to be turned on to render things correctly. Okay, so I was a bit confused. So then it it, it only occurs when you when you start the system up with the lid closed? Yes. Or when you, 
character. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah, I was not able to try that on the 20 pin. The 20 pin, it worked fine. But you're saying, Kay, that both it happened to you on the 21 pin? It happened to me on uh, an oval 21 pin. Um, and see. it did not occur on the round. And we're using the same image, right? Like um, the one that yeah. you were using for your Rhea is the same disc. Like I had the original discs in that. Uh, I'm going to try something a little bit later, uh, and I'll, I'll put it in the notes. I'm going to try and do the fast boot, as in it starts up from the disc, and I'll see if that will actually cause that bug to occur on my Saturn, and I'll let you guys know if that is the case. be pretty cool. So, um, Dave, uh, Claire, Pat, what do you guys feel about your experience with this game? You know, is it thumbs up, thumbs down? I'd thumbs give up. this game a thumbs up for sure, um, especially for fans of 3D platforming. I think this is really a must try. Um, so I've gone through Croc with my best friend, and it has been such a blast. We've had a great time playing together. Um, the frustrating moments are enjoyable, honestly, because the game is just so cute, and the soundtrack is so much fun to hum along to. I, I definitely recommend that if you like 3D platformers, try this game. I agree. I think it's really good. It has a lot of has a lot of issues with it, but I think all in all, it's still pretty fun. Uh, the controls are very frustrating, and I'm definitely gonna give it a shot with the 3D controller. And I'll mm-hmm. definitely let you know what I think. Then you can always use the switch, you know, for certain areas. Some 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 areas are gonna be easier to negotiate with the D-pad. So you can switch it over to digital, and then switch it back to analog, and kind of see what you like, but. Right, the analog is indispensable for boss fights, I think, with the way yeah. the camera moves. It's yep. really great for those. Mm-hmm. Especially some of those bosses move really quick, like they turn around real quick, and you kind of need to be able to run behind them a la you know, Mario 64 style kind of thing. I got you, know, you. You know, it's just, I give it a thumbs up personally. I absolutely love it, but I know I'm incredibly biased, and I have nostalgia, and I have memories for it. I think... It's one of those games where a lot of people just won't forgive it like I do, but I do think that it's it's not an expensive game, so what the heck, you know? I mean, if you're a collector. Um, if you're not a collector, I mean, at least give it a try on, a, on an emulator or a burn disc, you know? Cool. So an obscure piece of trivia for our obscure game of the cast is that Croc 2 was actually advertised on the back of the manual for Croc 1 as coming out. It never saw a release on the Saturn, like many games that started out on it. It saw a release on the PlayStation and on the PC. Womp womp. Now that we had our cordial discussion of the obscure game, why don't we go back into our main topic, which is of course backups, bootlegs, and reproductions on the Sega Saturn. So Dave, I know that you have a lot of experience with sort of reproductions in different areas, and I'd like you to start us off and uh, sort of talk about talk about it a little bit. Yeah, actually, this is one of the one of the oldest uh, show ideas that we've been kicking around as a group since early days uh, when we were you know proposing things that we would talk about and i you know i really wanted to cover the ethics of reproductions and what everybody feels about them because i know that between the three of us and now claire joining us i know we all have um proximity and we all have um experience with reproductions and and so i kind of felt like it would be a really awesome cast to cover incidentally it's gotten pushed back so far now that uh it turns out that the junkyards titan cast is also doing an episode uh shortly to come out about reproductions as well so you guys are definitely going to have to check out theirs as well when you're done listening to this one but uh but yeah you know i just kind of started picking up Saturn games on the cheap and one of the ways to do that is you know to buy like disc only or without a manual and uh, 
as a result, I got a copy of uh, Sonic R that didn't have a manual in it. And it occurred to me, why not just print a manual because this stuff is available online, you know? And that kind of, when I shared that, um, I got a lot of responses out of it and turned out lots of people are doing this. So it kind of opened my eyes to this kind of as being a thing and that like a whole new world of reproductions. And I guess it comes down to the fact that a lot of us have been doing discs with Sharpie on it for a long time, but uh, we kind of want something more. Definitely. Um, as a Saturn fan who's not a big collector, I only collect games that really have some kind of sentimental value to me, like the Panzer Dragon series, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always done most of my gaming using a stack of discs and a Sharpie. So... Recently, I've really been wanting more than that. I've been wanting to have something to display on my shelves because that's a lot of the joy I get out of having games, being able to look at them. So I'm really looking forward to talking about this topic, and I think it's one that's really prevalent in the community right now, especially with all the great reproduction work we have. And I'm really moving toward wanting to have display pieces for my shelves because part of the enjoyment of collecting is really having something to look at. Yeah, so just wanted to define a couple of terms because there's uh, a lot of different ways that people go ahead and describe, you know, this hobby, uh, specifically making uh, pretty backups, you know. So the first definition uh, I want to mention is what a backup is. And as Claire was saying, the Sharpie special is branded CD uh, that you buy wherever you can. Uh, Hopefully you're using good quality media, but most of these CDs will have the company's name written on the top, and you you take a Sharpie and just write that up. These discs are useless without some means of playing a backup, and it's really important that, you know, people don't just try to burn disc after disc and not realize that you have to know a method of playing a backup. The last thing you want to have is just a a bunch of useless disc frisbees and it turned out that you can oh I could play it after all right yeah exactly um, everything else that we talk about from that point you know is some form of a backup and just kind of builds on top of the concept so we had uh, in the late 90s um, Hong Kong has a huge piracy scene and they put out uh, a lot of Saturn games in the form of what was termed the only term I've ever heard it used was uh, HK or HK Silvers and these are discs that are pressed, but they do not have the security wobble that's um, required to boot up as a valid uh, Saturn disc. Um, they are often done on, even though with pressed art, uh, they're done on shiny-looking discs, which kind of gave them the, the name of HK Silver. Uh, you also have uh, bootlegs, which would be a pressed or printed disc that contain the game, but... Um, they're made to look as close uh, to the original as possible without giving any indication that the game is not an original. And that kind of falls in legs and counterfeit. That's really neat. So how exactly were they able to play that on their on systems in that case? I was able to uh, get my Saturn a mod board back in like 1996, 1997. So there was a lot of Chinese engineers, um, you know, who were, everyone had a vested interest, you know, at that point in time in Hong Kong about not having to pay full retail price for games. You know, it's kind of, you know, one of their things, their copyright laws were very loose. And uh, you, you would see development of, you know, mod chips, mod boards um, to be able to circumvent copy protection for games come out of Hong Kong a lot, going all the way back to uh, like Nintendo cartridge copiers. Um, I don't know if any were actually sold in Saturn's like, you know, you can play this, but um, I was very new to everything at that time period. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it's a, an interesting thing. I, I had one HK Silver, it was like a, or two, it was a Gundam Side Story 2 and 3. That's very fascinating. It makes me wonder if the whole issue with the uh, the, the Hong Kong games ban thing was maybe the push for uh, Phantom Chips and things of that nature to bypass this region encoding. Well, so the Phantom Chips and like mod boards in general for the Saturn, they don't um, bypass region issues. They only take care of like the 
um, the security ring or the security wobble to allow a game to be authenticated as an actual Saturn disc. But getting yeah. back to kind of where we're going, um, it, we've moved on from like you know bootlegs uh, you know, that were pressed, you know, like Hong Kong bootlegs, um, to this kind of a, a hobbyist scene with reproduction and the idea like they come in, in different forms you know people will call them different things but the idea here is that you take something that you love and you try to give it a presentation that it may not have had in the beginning so um, really high quality maybe using different art um there are lots of ways to you know go forward with a reproduction um some people are just trying to, you know, match up their, you know, like Dave did with uh, having a disc only copy of a game and he wanted a, a manual. Um, some people have done reproduction back art, like for a stall that has the proper logo on the side since the official pressing never had that. So, yeah, all of a bunch of different reasons. Nice. Uh, yeah, Dave, I definitely love to hear your opinion on the, on the hobbyist side. Yeah, well, I think that, um, I don't know, I, I I don't really know how long it's been going on. I just know that maybe a little over a year ago, sometime in 2016, when I, out of necessity, just, you know, I needed a, a random manual here or there. And this was when I really hadn't just bit the bullet and decided to get a game with complete, you know. I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll just save 10 or 20 bucks by getting without a manual. You know, when I would share, you know, some of the results that I got... Um, at first, I didn't really get a whole lot of feedback, and and some people were just like, "Oh, that's that's neat," and it seemed to me like nobody else was really doing it. But then, you know, slowly and surely, as I got more into it and as I started to get better, I started noticing other people starting to share and and starting to um, you know share results. and And I've even talked to guys like Ben Boyd who say that he's been doing this for you know several years. So I guess I just I wasn't aware of it in any kind of format. Like nobody was out there sharing their work, you know, until recently. Really, um, it's kind of had a snowball effect. It seems like awareness in the community and. Um, my thoughts on it as a as a hobby is that it's a lot of fun. You know, it's it's something that if you're an artist, you know, it's really it's really neat to to see these things come to fruition and you know to be working on a project for like a game that never existed or or maybe a game that was unreleased. You know, so what about um, a custom or something? You know, like a maybe like a present for somebody. Yeah, or like a present for somebody. Um, you know, I I had this idea. To do a police knots box coinciding with the release of the english patch police knots for saturn and um i put something up on the groups and this guy named pat was giving me guff and, <laughs> and saying that you know as good as nice as that looks you know wouldn't this be cool you know and he of course pointed me to wikipedia but if i had even bothered to look at wikipedia i didn't notice that uh there actually was a mock-up design for police knots uh to be released in the states that never saw the light of day uh, the, the release never saw the light of day but the mock-up did exist at least in a low resolution yeah apparently it came from a uh from a magazine article like a, or one of those manuals coming soon Do, were you able to see something in a manual like that because I, I went through all the manuals and instruction booklets and I never saw I can't find any that. other source for that image except for that image and I know that um, Wikipedia cites it as coming from some kind of trade magazine but um, but yeah no I think that's kind of what got me really going rolling with the idea of wow you know there's a lot of possibilities here um, you know so Patrick pitched the idea of like well let's let's make this happen let's make this actually a thing it may you know even though it kind of looks like a u.s konami release uh not the prettiest thing um Dave, you're, all, you're you're being so you're you're underselling yourself that thing i'm talking about the design you know because oh, i yeah. have like this super futuristic good looking police knots box in mind and then pat hits me up with this what honestly looks like a mid 90s konami release in the u.s and that is like not good looking okay you know like take a look at contra on the saturn you know look at look at what the u.s got but pat was like for historical accuracy wouldn't it be cool though to like to make this happen and i said yeah you know you got a point there that's that's cool so i kind of 
I kind of geeked out on that idea of, you know, like, here's this thing that was supposed to happen. And, you know, there's this box art for the U.S. copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga. There's this alternate box art that was in like a Toys R Us ad or something like that. And boy, if I could get, you know, some some better re- uh, source art for that, I would love to see that one happen, too, you know. Well, the, the cool thing about that was the police knots thing. Actually, the image was actually in a art book for the limited edition. It's on page twenty something, I think. Oh, uh, right, the cover, the cover image that that's uh, the mech suit, right? Yeah, because I looked all high and low for that thing, and I could not find it. But I, I looked them. I got, I bought the copy, and I looked through it, and it was right there. The image. They must have pulled it the same way I did from the art book. Mm-hmm. But it was a, uh, it and it was really good. It, it came out well, and I think I'm pretty sure that that Panzer Dragoon image is probably somewhere hidden mm-hmm. in some art book or art page thing. Yeah. Well, someday I'll find it. I mean, so you know, everybody has kind of a different idea, different tastes, different uh, you know preferences of what they would like to see in a release. You know, and I've seen that in the in the groups like Sega Creatives. You know, everybody kind of has a different take on what they would like a certain game to look like, and that's why there's just so much variety and variation. Uh, among the the reproduction scene but i know i can say for sure reproductions is really what brought pat and i together and i think k too you know to an extent you know on on the groups you know it's just i noticed that k was doing reproductions and really beautiful ones too and and so it got us talking you know yeah definitely um with that being said uh why don't we get into the legal aspects of it because i know that is a really huge issue with these reproductions and kind of copies so Kay, Kay and I were looking at the laws yeah I know real exciting right going through a bunch of legality stuff yeah we'll be I'll, I'll be we'll be our next lawyers for the uh, anyways um, backups are discussed in title 17 USC section 117 and as long as you own and maintain ownership of the original backup it, it or the original copy the backup is legal. One of the things that's interesting is that bypassing the copyright is illegal under the DMCA, but using the swap trick is technically not because you're not using a physical device or medium to do that. All you're doing is is tricking the system and using an exploit that exists in the system. There's no built-in hardware specifically to do that. So the only legal way to play backups of your own backups, of course, is through that swap trick. Uh, but, uh, I mean... Let's face it, we're all playing illegal backups. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it really... you know, th- This is the point in this where um, we want to take like an official stand. You know, we've kind of danced around this topic and you know have hinted or uh, talked about and promoted certain things, but officially like we all have our own personal ethics um about you know what we feel is and is not fair use for backups and reproductions so i think a way that we all feel about backups is that it should be to the point where it's unreasonable to find a legit way to play it so for example as dave and i were discussing something like police knots where it never existed in the u.s translated in english or for something that is lost to the annals of time, such as the source code for uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga, and all these other games that were DOA after the Saturn really failed. I mean, there's no way that you can legally buy a copy of Magic Knight Ray Earth anywhere. There's no way you can play buy Panzer Dragoon Saga anywhere. So I think that as in that case, that it, I think it would be okay in our eyes to do something like that, as there's no way anyone could possibly make money off of that copy ever again. But where we, I believe, where we draw the line is where there's ways to actually reasonably play it, such as Daytona USA or Virtual On from the Virtual Consoles, mm-hmm. and various other ways to play these games that you can support the developers and give them money to keep developing these things and releasing more. Because as we've been preaching for many, many times on this podcast, support the developers, because if you don't, then you won't see these games. You won't see these things be released. 
I mean, just recently they released the Street Fighter 2 Special Edition, the 25th anniversary, that was an actual reproduction cart of the original game. And if we could possibly get that interest going and show that, you know, Sega, we can, we can make money for you for these things, we, we could possibly have these again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, how do you guys feel about this? Well, you know, I, I think that I, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I think that a lot of people feel that uh, even even if they go out and they buy, you know, a copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga, a legit copy, you know, the, that money's not going to Sega. And so I think I think that kind of mentality kind of pervades, and people think, well, you know, if, if Sega is not getting my money, and either way, you know, what, what does it matter if I just you know buy a reproduction? You know, I'm giving some guy on eBay my money, five hundred bucks for this game, or I'm giving some guy on Etsy twenty five bucks for this game. You know, either way, the money's not going to Sega, and so I understand how that kind of mentality kind of uh, pervades in the community and. I do think that if uh, Sega or any of these uh, publishers uh, were moved in the future to, you know, produce this content, you know, to to reprint it, um, I definitely think that people ought to drop what they're doing and, and you know, open their wallets and, uh, you know, basically support the, the developer, support the publisher, you know, because we definitely want to show our support and we want to see good stuff like this produced. But... I do think that it's kind of a, a gray area and it's kind of a thing where we could go in circles about each person's personal ethics, really, because uh, it's easy to make the argument one way or the other, don't you think? Definitely. I mean, yeah, they're, they're not making this money off it. And I think Dave and everyone here will be the first to say that we're going to be the first in line if they do that. You know, because- I mean, the games that I bought back in the day, that was my chance to show Sega my support and a lot of good it did, right? <laughs> and it helped them kind of clear their balance sheet and move on to the dreamcast but anything that i'm picking up these days is is just going to some reseller on ebay definitely and i think we should get into our personal feelings on that because i know dave you have you have varying issues about reproductions in terms of sale and trickery of people that really want to find these games but have to worry if their manual for panzer dragoon or their magic knight ray earth disc is a fake or not sure yeah, I guess that's kind of what ruins it. it. Ruins the, I don't know. I might create something like a deep fear, U.S. long box deep fear, and I get all excited about it and I want to share, you know. And um, I'm not just sharing because I want a, a ego trip, you know. I want to go online and I, I'm excited to show people, look what I made, you know. It's exciting. And then you get a bunch of PMs saying, you know, I want this. I'll I'll give you money for it, you know. And um, for me, it's just kind of like there's just too much gray area and there's just too it's so complicated that I just feel hesitant or reluctant to sell that kind of thing. Because let's be honest, it's not my intellectual property. You know, I am using Sega's logo in it. And even if I do put, you know, reproduction or something like that, me personally, it's fine if I'm just giving it to Kay as a as a gift, as a friend, you know, or if I'm doing it for myself, for my own shelf, you know, but uh I just don't feel like I should charge anybody any money for that personally because it's not really... I'm using a lot of uh, IPs that don't belong to me, you know? Exactly, and you can get into a lot of legal trouble if somebody... Uh, I mean, well, they probably wouldn't, but I mean, if somebody yeah, decides to, they'd you know? be in the right. To so that's just see. why that's just why I'm hesitant, you know. But that doesn't that doesn't mean I look poorly on people who do. It just means that you know I've had opportunities and and I haven't capitalized on those because I've always felt a little too reluctant. Yeah, uh, Claire, why don't we go into some stuff that you talked about? So I know you wanted to talk a little bit about it as well. Um, I don't really have any thoughts that you guys haven't hit already. I gotcha. So you feel sort of the same way that the ethics to draw at retail availability for these? And is that uh, as in Saturn, or is that just everything in general? I would say Saturn on the original hardware. If I can't go to a store and buy it and play it on my original hardware, and if the original publisher is no longer seeing any profit from a purchase that I'd make, I wouldn't have a problem making a backup or buying a reproduction of that. But as Dave hit on earlier... I think that if games are ever re-released for original hardware, then I definitely would want to stop using my backups and, you know, try to support the publisher. And not only for that reason, but because it's really nice to have retail artwork to display. 
Mm-hmm. And here's a thought, and I'm I am jumping ahead a little bit, but it's timely. You know, what she's saying is just imagine if publishers become cognizant of the fact that this is becoming more and more pervasive that these reproductions are getting better and people are doing it more and more perhaps they catch the drift and realize there's a market for this stuff and then they do come back um and that prompts them to start reprinting these things well you know that could kill the reproduction market but that would be a good thing right because then we'd have an opportunity to buy the real thing right Right, and buy it for a reasonable price. Exactly, because they'd, of course, be able to produce it in high enough quantities to make it. Um, It's kind of like that. They have to understand that uh, this is what we want. You know, this is what the community wants. And if they're not going to give it to us, then, you know, some some guy on Etsy is going to give it to us, you know? Very poorly, I might add. Well, and that's the thing is people keep raising the bar, you know? Yeah, Um, I mean, why don't we we go into some of the, the quality discussion? I mean... There's definitely, I think the repros are notorious for varying levels of quality and what you pay for is what you get, essentially. Absolutely. I mean, I've bought a repro. There's a guy on Etsy, I won't name names, but uh, he's been around there for a while and this was a while back. I mean, this was a couple of years ago. Um, got one of those and, and thought that it was good, you know, thought that it was good because I'd never seen anything else. And when we're talking about discs, our buddy K here, a murder of crows, kind of gave me a, a redefinition of what good is, you know, for a disc, you know, because um, he kind of like set the bar so high that I'm seeing like all these really poor practices when it comes to doing reproduction discs in the community. And lots of people, it really just comes down to the fact that they just don't care and they're not willing to try a little bit, you know. And um, and I think that's why K's output may not be as huge as some of these other guys that are just out there just pumping discs out without any care to the quality. But he really takes the time, you know, to make these things a work of art and print like at the highest quality possible. So there's an example of, you know, that caught my eye and really caused me to kind of hit Kay up and start this relationship with Kay. And and, uh, I don't know, that's how I became cognizant of the fact that discs, they can be done better and they are being done better. So like Dave, one of my first experiences with Saturn Reproductions was actually coming across Kay's A Murder of Crows sales page. I didn't really know that Saturn reproductions were a big thing until I found his work. I had been exposed to reproductions through the Super Nintendo. That's really where my original interest in them started because there were a bunch of Square games published for the Super Nintendo that were Japanese only, and I really wanted the opportunity to be able to own them and play them on my original hardware. Mm -hmm. So that's where I really started with reproductions, but... Like I said, Kay's work was my first exposure to Saturnary Productions. Yeah. Kay, do you want to talk about how, you know, how you kind of have a different take on doing discs? You don't just do like straight copies or bootlegs. Yeah. Uh, when I first started even attempting this scene, you know, the primary goal was um, making a physical you know, product that wasn't available and and I I hold on to that you know pretty you know um, pretty strongly uh, as like my initial like moral or ethical compass. Um, things like translation projects or unreleased games um, and trying to you know come up with a, a concept of what that might look like, but making sure that it uh, cannot be mistaken for an original. So recently, you know, we're we're seeing like a lot of hack. For example, there's a, a whole whole means of being able to play uh, some games for the Saturn in a 16 by 9 widescreen uh, format, and it involves you know hacking the uh, the disc image to be able to allow that. Um, and one of those games is Panzer Dragoon Saga, it allows you to to do that with these these hack. It would be really simple to. You know, go to like Sega Retro or you know any of these other locations. Um, even I think the Covers Project had some for a while that just took a scan of the original disc art and didn't do anything to clean it up, um, and then pop that onto a disc. 
Uh, it's also easy if you have the Photoshop skills to be able to recreate some of that kind of art. And that's really like, uh, I feel like the biggest problem in the reproduction scene is that, you know, if you are new to, you know, any of the ideas of, you know, not having an original uh, disc, you know, an original pressed disc, um, you might not be aware of what that disc is supposed to look like. And you might not be aware of uh, how good reproductions can look. Mm-hmm. So it's really kind of up to um, other people who make reproductions. It's incredibly important, I feel, ethically for us to be able to continue doing this sort of thing that you don't use the original disc art. Or if you do use the original you know, disc art, that you make it incredibly clear and obvious that it is a reproduction. Mm-hmm. One thing that annoys me is that they literally are just grabbing the, you know, grabbing the image or the PDF or whatever off of Sega Retro and then slapping it on a disc printer at at a high resolution, you know, but there's that like waviness to the bottom of the Japanese disc label, you know, they don't even bother photoshopping that out or they don't even try to vectorize the, the image that you just get like this what really looks like a poor scan you know and i'm just like the lack of effort that they put into it just makes me think like that that's that's where i'm like i fail to see how this is art you know um and not just simple bootleg you know so it's like even even because they're not putting in any kind of effort i i definitely agree that if somebody is you know going to take the japanese disc label or the american disc label and they are going to vectorize it up and make it look really nice that they ought to print obviously in very big bold you know reproduction by so and so or you know this is a reproduction but uh but definitely what drew me to a murder of crows discs is that each one is a kind of a unique piece of art, you know? I mean, th- these are reproductions, but they they really are, like, unique, you know? And something different. They're not just bootlegs. Yeah, right? I really love the, the discs, all the artwork that everyone puts into it. And I think that really differentiates in terms of a reproduction and a recreation. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you put your heart and soul into that. And I think, really, that in terms of quality, I think that's where they both differ. And I think... And I think I'd rather have that quality and have a lot less quantity and not the quality there. So uh, why don't we sort of talk about where we started on backups, bootlegs, and burn games and sort of talk about how we really got into it. So uh, basically the way I started hearing about it was through the crappy NES bootlegs and all those mall kiosk games, which basically took a, a Super Famic- a Famicom cart and shoved into the bottom of the, the controller. I don't know if you guys ever remember that by any chance. I like the malls. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's really how I heard about it years ago. And I actually look, I actually heard about the Phantom as well. And I really thought for the longest time that was the only way to be able to play these backups. So I never really got into it when I had the Saturn. And I didn't really get much into it until the pseudo Saturn, which I think is probably a revolution in that whole the whole backup game scene. Mm-hmm. What about the, what about you guys? Well, similar to what you're saying, I mean, I, not not so much original Famicom, but um, I think I think I kind of mostly got aware of of reproductions uh, from from like the SNES reproductions, like Terranigma. I think uh, Star Fox Two. You know, they were doing the like using donor carts with the FX two chip uh, to do Star Fox 2 and I thought that was, that caught my eye um, I thought that was really cool um, and then of course I'm a huge DS fan, I love D- uh, the DS and there are so many excellent RPGs that didn't come over, you know, that got translations like Blood of Bahamut or uh, there was another one Soma Bringer, uh, Monolith Soft game and and, and Blood, Blood of Bahamut was a square game uh, some really good, awesome stuff that did get English patches and you know you could play them on like a you know ds2 cart or one of those things you know but you could also buy like reproductions of them on like etsy uh full package with the box and everything translated and and i was like wow this is like a thing you know there's and they look like the real thing you know um which i guess shouldn't be a surprise because there's so many like fake ds games out there but uh so they're they're pretty good at doing that already but uh (laughs) 
you know, I'd wondered, I'd wondered to myself, like, is this a thing for disc based media? You know, is it possible? Could it be possible to create a reproduction for the Saturn that would actually work on a virgin console? And of course, we know the answer to that is no, because of that wobble. Um, you know, it, people who are selling reproductions they are relying on the buyers to have a means like Kay said to play backups so you know that's kind of the caveat but that's how how i kind of got aware of it so like dave my entry into the reproduction scene was with the super nintendo there were a lot of games released specifically rpgs that only came out in japan and that was really disappointing for me um i knew that these games existed and that I might be able to play them on an emulator, but I really had my heart set on playing them on original hardware. So my first reproduction purchase was actually Seiken Densetsu 3, mm-hmm. Secret of Mana series. And I went on to establish quite a collection of things like Romancing Saga 3, um, Final Fantasy 5, just all of those great games mm-hmm. that were released that were Japanese only. And I, I really enjoy owning them and having those cartridges in my collection. And are those donor carts? How do, yes. Are they, yeah, okay. the ones, the ones that do. I have are donor carts. Um, they're just fan translations that are patched. It's just, it's just like, yeah, it's just like the ROMs that we'd use with an emulator. It's just slapped on a cartridge and with some nice artwork on the front. Yeah. And manuals and stuff like that? I have a boxed version of Bahamut Lagoon. That one has a manual in a box. Cool. Yeah, so how about you, Kay? How did you become aware of reproductions kind of as a thing? The uh, the, the first things that I saw you know, were HK Silvers. Um, and that was like, you know, um, just the, the whole Hong Kong, you know, flooding the market with, you know, bootlegs, basically. Uh, hobbyist reproductions. And I don't remember specifically the thing that I saw. Um, but what I do remember... Uh, with a lot of the um, retro gaming expos that you know that we've had, uh, I made friends with a couple of people in the you know local area, and the first one that I purchased um, was actually a reproduction of Stadium Event on the NES. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, a pretty decent looking um, label on a very poor condition cart. Um, but, you know, I didn't think too much of it because I wasn't intending on selling it or anywhere else. Um, you know, and I knew what it was and it was just more of a like, part of a, a history of video games for my daughter. And, uh, since that point in time, um, Chris Tramu from Lost Classics is a, a friend of mine and, um, he produces, uh, you know, a lot of really great reproduction carts, um, and uh, Johnny Mono, actually, who is a fan of our show, um, does some reproduction carts as well. And uh, yeah, like I guess the the prize of my reproduction collection. Um, I'm a huge Legend of Zelda fan, mm-hmm. and uh, I actually own two different like reproductions because I just loved how the packaging was. Um, you know, on uh, the Legend of Link. Oh yeah, fantastic! And that's kind of like like the the major thing. Like, I wasn't really so into reproducing. Or, you know, picking up reproductions of games that, like, existed in Japan without translation. You know, you have to have a reason for that reproduction. Mm-hmm. But Legend of Link being, like, a completely brand new game and totally pushing the Nintendo, of all things, to its absolute limits, um, combined with, you know, great artwork, uh, the box, um, you know, e- even, like, uh, some of the little extras that came in there, the styrofoam, you know, like... I, it's almost like it's the epitome of any reproduction. It doesn't matter what system it was for. This was gorgeous looking to me and, and included everything. Mm-hmm. Nice. All right. So um, speaking of some of those newer reproductions, why don't we move into our present section of the reproduction and talk about what's going on now with them compared to what happened in the past where we had these not so good solutions and kind of good, kind of bad and in the middle reproductions. So why don't we start off and talk about the pros of these modern reproductions. So the gaming scene recently has, as of like 2012, really blown up to a large level. And right now, the Saturn and the 32-bit are the hottest things on the market. The games are getting more and more expensive, and it's getting a lot harder to find a lot of games, especially when everyone's paying top dollar. 
So one of the good things about the modern reproduction is that you can have a good, nice-looking game and not have to pay all the money for the really rare ones like uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga or these other ones and have a hard time hunting them down. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather have like a nice, kind of nice reproduction of a game and then if I really like it, I'll li- save up my tax money tax season guys right and uh buy a a really good original copy of it yeah for sure i mean it's a low-cost alternative to you know collecting games at inflated market value exactly i mean and then another thing speaking of that that i I love is that you can try before you buy so for those people that really want to play eiffel home you can actually just try it before you pay the six thousand plus dollars to actually own it and yes it is that much money (laughs) So if you guys really want to play, pay that money, which I know you probably don't, you'd want to try it. And I think that's really the best things about the modern reproductions. If Why you were able to want to play Eiffel Home, <laughs> just kidding. right? Even with games um, whose reputations kind of precede them, like Panzer Dragoon Saga, it's not a game for everyone. And I, I think it's really important that people try these games out if if they're not just aiming to collect and they're aiming to own things that they want to play and enjoy then i think that um backups and repros are really great for being able to do that and you know feeling confident about your purchases you know i like claire saying i mean i think it's really backups if you're just maybe kind of curious about a game i think repros is kind of where people are taking it to the next level um, they're in the middle. They they know they like the game. They want it in some format, but they they just can't afford the astronomical prices for it, you know. And um, and you know, like I was saying before, the the quality keeps getting better every day. I uh, I think that with more awareness, with more people out there that are doing this, people keep kind of raising the bar and setting new standards. Like you know, when we find out that um, that one guy is you know doing some kind of technique or doing some kind of thing, you know, that kind of raises everybody's standards and everybody's outlook on what is possible, you know, then we kind of go back to the drawing board and we look at, you know, what, what do we need to do to, to make these things better? So as a result, you know, reproductions are actually getting better and, and, uh, the, these, these low cost alternatives are becoming even more appealing as additions to the shelf, you know? Right. For me, it's like buying any other work of art. Um, the special thing about reproductions is that each creator's own personal vision for that cover art or that disc shines through. And you really get to kind of feel, you know, their their take on the game just through looking at that on display. And that's one of my favorite things about reproductions. The, the quality does vary from artist to artist for sure you know and you'll see that if you go to places like the cover project online you um access to a huge library of crowd sourced you know art content you know covers and stuff like that and you will see that there's a lot of variety but not a whole lot of standardization in in quality but um but that's the thing it it, like claire said it's all unique everybody kind of has a different take everybody's using to a certain extent different source material i mean you may see the same image used um, in several different ways, you know, or several different takes, you know, so it is kind of interesting to, and, you know, I've seen even that people have like a certain favorite artist that they like to go with and pretty much stock their shelf with art from that artist, you know, so that's a thing as well. All right, guys. So now we talked about sort of the pros with reproductions. Why don't we talk some more about the cons and issues that might pop up? Because I know there's definitely a lot of them. Well, I'm, I don't know. Like, I guess I'm just concerned that the market is going to be flooded with reproductions, whether labeled as such or otherwise, um, that are just going to, it's going to make it a daunting task for like websites to, de- or even retro games conventions to like delineate between the real thing or not. Even if, even if they can tell, it's just much more overhead, you know, them having to take the time. And then of course it results in more policies and 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 more enforcement you know a lot of retro games conventions are really um coming down hard you know on on resellers and saying that they have to be very clearly labeled which they should anyway you know but that that takes more time off of them it's more headache you know and and we're only going to see it more as the market continues to be flooded with reproductions it's like anything. It's like GBA games. Kay was telling me the other day. It's just it, it gets hard for a buyer to even know the difference, you know, because they get so good. And you know, you may be looking at a hundred listings on eBay, and 
who knows how many of those are just a reproduction, you know? I mean, I've actually seen some of those Game Boy ones flooding like sites like OfferUp and Craigslist. So stuff like that is not really linked to the internet only. I mean, I'm seeing this stuff in public. Exactly. And so I guess in a con, as a con, it's more for people who are looking for the real thing, you know, it becomes much more of a problem. Right, and um, there's even a concern, too, with certain parts of maybe a complete inbox copy being passed off as the real thing, like a reproduction manual being mm-hmm. stuck in with a retail disc and not really advertised as such. Exactly. Uh, while I was building out my North American Saturn set, one of the games that I needed probably about midway through was a copy of Resident Evil. And I actually purchased a copy off of eBay that when it arrived, um, I looked at the back, uh, you know, the case art, and it was um, just on Kodak photo paper, like not a very good, you know, scan that had been printed. And when I, like I hadn't uh, checked the art until probably about two or three weeks after getting the game in. So if taken from the right angles, and you, know, you can reasonably expect that a game would be legitimate based on photographs and then have it arrive. And you know, having been in Saturn collecting as long as I have been, I got fooled. And so it does happen. And it's mm-hmm. been happening now. That happened 2013, 2014. Wow. It's really ridiculous seeing that sort of stuff pop up. And I think that I think as time goes on, we'll see more and more of that stuff being prevalent, which mm-hmm. is really sad if you think about it. That now we have to question everything. We have to look on. Uh, we have to look at everything through a microscope. It's just really unnecessary and really just ruins the hobby for some people. That's how I had to be with the DS stuff. You know, just incredibly just scrutinizing every little detail and and i'd get stuff in and it kind of opened my eyes to publishing as a whole because sometimes you would get sometimes you get a run of a game that just was printed on really poor paper stock or it, like legitimately they used like a low dpi uh for the manual and it was it would be like a capcom like some of the phoenix Wright games you know there's a lot of bootlegs out there but some of like some of the original games there's not like standardization in the printing of the manuals so that does happen you know even with saturn games uh like the u.s long boxes depending on the publisher how cheap they were how much money they wanted to try to save you know there's some corner cutting for sure and some people even ask is this real or is did i just get like a bootleg manual and no no it really is, uh, you know, that pub- that specific publisher was just trying to cut corners. But then again, like you said, I mean, with so many more repros out there, it's really hard to tell, you know, what's real and what's not. And it's going to be. And that's what makes me think that maybe the um, publishers are going to finally kind of catch up to all this and, and realize that there's a lot of money exchanging hands and none of that going into their pockets. You know, it would be fantastic if, you know, like, even if they don't bring back the Saturn presses and we're able to, you know, start doing new pressings of the disc, there is an obvious market for those of us who have built collections with disc only to start. And I don't think it would be all that difficult for some of these companies. I don't know for sure. You know, like, don't hold me to this, but mm-hmm. I will. They. <laughs> If they just started pressing or you know printing out um, their long box cases, uh, artwork and manuals again, can you just imagine the back catalog some of these people have over the years? Yeah, um, I mean, and it, it'd be very simple to do compared to trying to get a disc that has certain wobbles or some security mechanism in it to get it to play on a Saturn. So that's actually really good thinking. I never thought of that. But I think the most likely approach that a company nowadays would try for is some kind of uh, mini console like Nintendo's doing, you know, some kind of form of emulation, because that's going to be if they can get it working and get it working consistently well, that's going to be the easiest way for them to publish or, you know, upload new releases and and make things available. I don't want to sound too jaded. You know, I would love for, you know, companies like Sega to do physical releases, but it's kind of that whole like brick and mortar blockbuster mentality versus Netflix. It's, 
it's always going to be easier and cheaper for them to offer digital content. But I would even jump at the chance to buy, you know, a well emulated copy of Panzer Dragon Saga, for example, on a Sega platform where I knew I was able to give my money to the publisher. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? Um, that really brings me into a really interesting topic that I wanted to talk about which was how would this really affect the pricing of the gaming market in that regards if something like that happened or if the repros just were all over the place i mean yeah, i don't know i've asked i've thought that to myself too and a lot of people speculate oh you know will repros drive down the demand for legit games will they will they really i don't know like they you know people collect because they want to collect the real thing um, be, you know, there's always that argument that, oh, well, people that are re- buying re- reproductions probably wouldn't buy the real thing anyway. They were probably just going to, you know, have a CD wallet full of blanks, you know? Yeah, and that's sort of my th- my mentality on that is that I think it really is not going to have any effect on the market per se for people that want to buy the repros versus the actual game. Disc I mean, is going to have a much bigger effect on the market. Yeah. That's next podcast. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think that just the, the fact that people are collectors, they want these games. These aren't like people that play them. They really just want to collect them. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, they also play them, but you know, you know what I mean, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the prices will stay the same. They won't have any effect compared to something like vinyl records or comic books. Mm-hmm. I mean, fakes do exist for that stuff, but I think with the Saturn and the way that especially for the discs that it requires some sort of bypass, that's going to be a lot harder to do stuff of that nature yeah. and really affect that market. I mean, I mean, once you put that disc in and yeah. it doesn't work, you're going to be sending a nasty message on eBay or show up in person somewhere. Well, I know you said it for next cast, but like with the disc rat thing, that's a real that's a real thing to think about. I mean, a lot of a lot of people who may be just now considering collecting, they're hearing about this disc rot, and then they're thinking, you know, well, why invest a bunch of money into a collection that I know is going to rot out? You know, um, the way that Tayo Yudins and JVCs and some of these higher quality media are pressed these days, it's not something you'll have to worry about for many many years. You know, and they're definitely made to a higher specification than those mid 90s discs you know so i think that that's an appeal for a lot of people is like you know well it may not be the real thing but it's going to look pretty it's going to be a work of art and i don't have to worry about it rotting out anytime soon exactly i mean somebody brought up a good point with that i think it was pathy and yes punk on a podcast where eventually these will just be display pieces and coasters Mm mm-hmm just like a real existential question, you know, what what it's all for anyway. I mean, you got a RIA, right? Yeah. You're playing everything digitally, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, okay, what do you uh, what do you think about this? Um, I, I think, like, the tying back kind of to the, the ethical, you know, question, like, especially with, with Discrot. Um, so we're seeing this medium that 25, 35 years ago was promised to basically last forever. It's supposed to be like the be-all, end-all of storage medium. And we have a combination of poor production for some of these storage uh, devices, the CDs, and also low print runs because, face it, like the Saturn's not the most popular system around. And well, I so beg with, to differ. <laughs> what's the most popular one for us? In but, our bubble. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, you know, I feel like backups, reproductions, and archiving have a place here that kind of almost go beyond the laws of the land. It's this commitment that, you know, some of us will have towards retaining the history. Uh, when these copies have got, are gone, you know, like the, the original discs are gone, especially in the, uh, we keep bringing up Panzer Dragon Saga. It's pretty much like, you know, the poster child for why backups and reproductions exist. You know, low print run, end of the Saturn's life, you know, really well received game, fantastic gameplay and um, lost source code. It's, mm-hmm. it's the perfect storm of, you know, like, why? If anybody wanted to, you know, give a, a reason as to why backups and reproductions should exist, you know, and be a, a legal recourse, you know, for, for your people to be able to play, that game is fantastic, and you're not going to be able to play it without, you know, shelling out, I think the current price range is about 500 to $600, you know, mm-hmm. for an original set. Uh, of this game and does the same I, thing go for magic knight ray earth why is that one so so reproduced 
So lately with um, Ray Earth, I mean, I would say like the last few years, um, it, it, it was not as low of a print run, but it was, you know, kind of a, a lower print sure. run. It was the end of Saturn's life. Mm-hmm. But it actually happens to be a fantastic game. And th- this is going to be like a, a case less of uh, how many were produced, but how many are now available to buy on the secondhand market. Hmm. You know, there's a lot more prints of that than there are of Panzer Dragon Saga, to my knowledge. But, you know, when people started finding out, no, this is a, actually a really decent game, you know, and it's kind of like the swan song for the Saturn. Uh, the copy started drying up and, you know, collectors who are interested in the fact that it's a working designs game and working designs did full disc art and variants of disc art. You know, some of them are going to want to collect all of the different disc art. And you go from a game that at one point when I was actively looking for it was about a hundred bucks or so to now it's like in the three, three fifty range. And the the question keeps coming back to like, why, you know, like if we have opportunities to be able to enjoy the game, then it's the collector's market that's driving up the price or the lack of knowledge, right? You either want a nice shelf piece to go with an original copy or you have an ethical reason, you know, to want to have the original copy. But as time moves on, those original copies are like time bombs. They're going to go away in one way or another, unless you keep them in like an airtight, you know, locked down, climate controlled vault. And then... Wait, you guys don't do that? (laughs) But then you have it in a vault and you can't actually pull the disc out to play. All right, guys. So now that we've talked about the past and what really went on with the early adaptions for the reproductions and backups, we talked about what's going on currently with that scene. Why don't we go into the future and talk about the overarching dystopia of this whole system? Maybe some dream projects we'd like to see translated and put out as reproductions. So I would definitely like to start with you, Claire, and maybe talk about some of your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, like we said, um, it's kind of hard to predict what all of this will do to the market. I personally don't see it changing much for the reasons we discussed, but... Um, there are a whole bunch of projects that I'd really like to see happen as far as reproductions or English translations of games that aren't available to us yet. I, I feel like I can't talk a whole lot here because I actually got my biggest wish, which was an English translation of the Revolutionary Girl Utena game based on the anime. It's a visual novel, and that was recently finished, I think, a year or so ago, and I really enjoyed that one, but... If there was a single series that I'd really like to see translated into English, it would have to be Soccer Wars. Um, I am 100% in agreement with you. Yeah, that would be huge. Yeah, it's just seen so little localization as a series. We just haven't, we haven't gotten them over here, and there's not a great way to play Soccer Wars as of right now. So that's the highest on my wish list. I, I definitely have to agree with you on Soccer Wars. I really think it's a really fun game. It has a lot of ties to our Lord and Savior, Sagata Sanchiro. And I just think that it's a game that's really unique. And the only game we ever got out of that series was the uh, So Long My Love on the PS2, which also was a really great game. I definitely would play that if I were you guys. But mm-hmm. that's beyond the scope of this cast. Um, in terms of the future reproductions, I would love to see Snatcher reproduced. Yeah. As you guys know, uh, yeah, it had a English release on the Mega Drive or the Genesis if you're a U.S. person. It's like a CD, yeah. The, um, the, that sort of uh, 32-bit version of that, the one on the PlayStation and Saturn, had a lot of major upgrades like CGI cutscenes, uh, more enhanced music, enhanced scenes, and a lot of uh, cut content that wasn't that didn't come out on the state side due to uh, size constraints on the Mega Drive or just not the ability to do it yet. So that's one of the biggest ones I'd love to see. And it's a really great game on itself, but it could be better. On top of that, I would like to see uh, the Samurai Spirits RPG come out as a big uh, Neo Geo fan because I just love the Neo and it's probably one of my favorite systems and me and my friends are just dying to play that game but besides that that's really what i'm really aiming for i, I got police not so i'm very happy so i'm not one to complain but uh, uh what about you guys how do you feel about that stuff i think the number one game if it, the game to rule all games if it came to as an english release and it, it would depend on 
you know, a, a translation team to actually handle this, and that hasn't happened yet, is is Grandia. If Grandia came to the Saturn, I could die and go to heaven, you know. Um, I, I could too. It's but, really but, the definitive, right? the definitive version. Is oh on the my Saturn. god, I would just love it. I would just love that so much. But uh, aside from that, and that really is like I. So when you said soccer wars, that there's another one that I wasn't even thinking about, but you're absolutely right. But Grandia, I think more so. But I would love to see. I know they just jump started the Princess Crown translation again, and I'm really excited to see that come to fruition. A Princess Crown. Um, I would be interested in creating some, you know, long box art for that. Um, I would also love to see Bakken Rotor translated. There's a reproduction project that I'd like to either see or maybe have a hand in myself. Um, it's one of those ones that I would, you know, be interested in doing a repro for. I think it's really funny, Dave, though, that we had this discussion earlier before that if all these RPGs came out in English and were playable, that we think Saturn probably would have been par and par with the PS1. Well, um, yeah, in my eyes. I, that may not do it for some folks, but but yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, damn you, Bernie. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, poor old Bernie. But, Kay, what about yours? Yeah. Well, b- before um, we get to mine, um, I want to say a shout out to Cyber Warrior X, who was leading the Princess Crown translation and also used uh, Professor Grace of you know, JHL's work to help produce the first versions of Pseudo Saturn that we had. So cool. it's kind of like a, a tie into what he was doing with the uh, Princess Crown. Cool. As far as what I'd like to see, um, I just want to see more Saturn software development in general. You know, I, I'd like to see you know like source codes released. You know, if we can't find um, the uh, original publishers or developers anymore, you know, maybe we can find some of the the source codes for unreleased games or you know alternate versions, things of that nature, and maybe we can actually have like a crowdsourced you know fan build up to you know make these games that could only exist in reproductions. Another one that you know kind of hit was that there's a uh, an Oscar uh, 120 percent limit over, which was um, from the rumor uh, was created by the original developers as kind of a uh, uh, enhanced version or modified version to fix a lot of the gameplay issues that the you know original game had. So the idea of being able to you know have original developers who have moved on in their careers or whatever come back to the Saturn and develop, the only way that you were going to be able to play any of those games is through reproductions or backup. And that's and that's one of the things that I love about these reproductions is that we can finally get the games we never got in America. And that's why I thank everybody that does it. I thank you, UK. I thank you, Dave, for making that beautiful art. Mm-hmm. Just everybody. And, you know, I know there's a lot of legal issues, but I think... If there's one thing that reproductions could be for, it would have to be that purpose. And I 100% agree with their use for that. I think one of the challenges that a lot of us that, who are, have a hand in this and are involved in this community are seeing is just um, we're really coming up against the limitation of source material, you know? And uh, that's that's one of those things that we continue to search for. Um, and, and Kay made a great point. You know, this is all really at the end of the day. It's all about preservation, you know. And that's why, you know, it, it excites me just as much to see somebody come online with a scanned art manual, you know, as much as it does to come online with a reproduction, you know, because when new new source material is unearthed and, and made available for the community, um, it, it that's what drives these projects, you know. Um, it's it's really hard sometimes to come up with high fidelity source material for for the artwork, you know, for these things. And and what you may notice with a lot of reproductions is that a lot of the text is vectorized and it's you know sharp as a razor. And then you've got a lot of this really compressed, you know, low res images that have been upscaled, you know, and so. Like I said, you know, I'm really happy that you were able, Pat, to help me out with that and supply me with a, a good quality image that we were able to use for that reproduction. And so that's kind of what excites me in, in this scene and in this community is as we grow in awareness of this and as we all kind of take part in this together, uh, we come together like these huge communities come together and we share uh, materials and, and you know, um, we kind of help drive these projects. Exactly.
thank you everybody for listening to yet another edition of our podcast um we want to do a couple of quick mentions for um the new show members who are putting out some content first off let's start off with uh peter he came out with a ton of great articles recently uh, the last couple days with the daytona usa article which i think is fantastic uh, not to mention his knights article on top of that absolutely uh, fantastic yeah, he he's doing some great work, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. I'll uh, definitely be looking out for his Shiro challenges that he includes in his articles. He really he um, gives us some tips and tricks to really get the most out of each game, and challenges us to find everything that there is to find in them. Mm-hmm. It's almost like reading a uh, mag- Sega magazine in the '90s again, right, guys? Choose your own adventure, kind of thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I like it. that he's doing that and making it interactive for sure. And I mean, and Pete's a great writer. He really is. And of course, we can't forget our wonderful Claire and her article on PD on Panzer Dragoon Saga. Oh, yeah. Did you want to plug that a little bit, Claire? Sure. Um, a lot of it has to do with the things we've been talking about in this cast. Um, the fact that you really don't need to own a retail copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga in order to enjoy it... Um, make a backup or buy a repro and have at it. It's a great game, and um, in 2018, there are more ways to experience it than there ever have been. Enough said. On top of that, I would also like to recommend you check out uh, Chaz's gameplay videos. He's going to be doing episodes 4 and 5 of the Panzer Dragoon 100% streams, where he's going through the entire Panzer Dragoon saga and 100% completing it and giving you a, a full guide all the tips and secrets, all the goodies you need to know. And he's going to be doing that at 5 p.m. EST every single Sunday. So even though you're going to miss number four, he's going to have five, six, seven, eight, and to add an infinite item until he finishes. So definitely check that out on Facebook, and we'll be posting all the videos as they come out on YouTube as well. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted to just take another chance to, to shout uh, the Junkyards Titan cast. Sam, those guys over there. They're they're gonna do their own take on uh, on this whole topic that we've been uh, discussing, and you guys definitely cannot miss that either. You must watch the, their cast. Yeah, absolutely. They, that's gonna be next week, so be looking for that. If right. you uh, have any questions or comments or even future cast ideas, we have an email address for you now. It's contact at segasaturnshiro dot com. Yeah, let us know feedback. You have any questions, complaints? You can do that. And thank you to Johnny Mono from the Bits, Bases, and Baskets uh, podcast, who um, is a fan of our show. Uh, we're very humbled and greatly appreciative. Uh, he was our first contact, and we'll be answering those kinds of questions in future cast. And at the end of the day, um, I feel that our biggest hope, and the reason why we're here in this podcast, is that. We don't care if you're using a backup, a reproduction, a emulator, or an original disc. You must play Sega Saturn. You must play Sega Saturn. You must play Sega Saturn. You must, or else. We'll come after your whole family. (laughs) Damn, it got dark fast. (laughs) (laughs) Alright, guys. Well, uh, from us here at Sega Saturn Shiro, we bid you adieu. (laughs) 